Those that are new here at Nairobi Chapel, we are in a journey as a church through the Old Testament. Uh, we started the book of Genesis earlier in the year. We are continuing on in the book of Genesis. And um, I'm now transitioning us from Abraham to Isaac. So we are now on Genesis chapter 22. Just to give us a picture of how we're going to proceed this month as we look at the character and the person of Isaac after Abraham, uh, we've titled the series Flourishing in Your Desert. Um, so what I've basically done is taken three images from Isaac's life to be able to communicate to us how to flourish in your desert. The first image we look at today is the image of wood uh, from chapter 22. Next Sunday, we'll look at Isaac and how he got a wife. Uh, so it's going to be wife. And then on the, 20, on the end of the month, we're going to look at chapter 26. And we will look at the image. The image, the last image is wells. The wells that he dug in chapter 26. So that's kind of how we're going to proceed. Uh, tell your neighbor, flourishing in your desert. That's exactly what we're going to be looking at uh, in the next few weeks. So we are in Genesis chapter 22. That's where we are. Um, many of us know that by this time, God has finally fulfilled his promise to both Abraham and Sarah. Abraham is 100 plus years old. Sarah was 90 when they got this promised child, Isaac. And Abraham was 100 years old when they got the promised uh, son, Isaac. We see that in chapter 21, uh, just before chapter 22. So in between chapter 21 and chapter 22, there is about 20 years. 20 years has elapsed. And for 20 years, Abraham and Sarah have had the delight of being parents. Abraham and Sarah have had the delight of cherishing and bringing up the son of promise that God had promised to them. And true to his name, Abra no, sorry, Isaac has brought laughter to this family. True to his name, Isaac have bro has brought joy and laughter even uh, to Abraham and Sarah's family. Life seems good now. Abraham has his long-awaited son, but Abraham has also formed a treaty with a man called Abimelech. And he has formed a treaty to secure himself from all the threats from the other Canaanite kings that are around him. So Abraham is feeling safe. Abraham is feeling free from all external threats. And Abraham is in a place of joy and laughter because they are now bringing up their promised son. Life is good. One of our sons, Dan, uh, when he's enjoying um, chocolate or when he's watching, you know, something that he enjoys, he usually crosses his legs and he sits back and says, life is good. Um, and, and, and that's really the, the, the phrase that comes out at this stage in Abraham's life. Life is, life is good. I mean, it's safe, it's nice, it's enjoyable. Everything seems to be going the way it should. And then suddenly, in chapter 22 of the book of Genesis, God now speaks to Abraham and tells him, Now take your son, Isaac, your only son whom you love, and go to Mount Moriah and offer him up on that mountain. God now tells Abraham, when everything is going well, when life is good, he tells him now, I want you to now go and sacrifice that son on the mountain. I don't know if any of us has ever been here. Just when everything is good, just when everything is going well, you feel as if life has pulled the rug from underneath your feet. You feel as if God has pulled the rug from underneath your feet. And you find yourself 
at a place of such challenge, such difficulty, and such hardship, where things have suddenly turned around and you did not anticipate it because things had just settled and things were going on fine. I don't know what the hardest thing that you've ever had to either do or go through is. But Abraham finds himself in such a place. Now, if you're like me, one of the hardest things I've had to go through this year is to see Arsenal lose the EPL, okay, if you're, if you're a soccer fan like me. And it's even more painful because last night, the team that, you know, won, went to win the treble. I mean, it's adding insult to? It, it's not, guys, don't look at me like, it's not easy. It's not easy. But that's on a light note. On a serious note, there may be someone here that is going through one of the toughest and one of the hardest seasons of their life. And you feel like Abraham. You feel like you're going through one of the most challenging seasons of your life. Now, I need you to know that this was not Abraham's first challenge. This was not Abraham's first desert experience. Many of you remember, Abraham had already relocated from Ur of the Chaldeans to Haran. And he continued to live in nine other places. He moved from place to place. He had experienced the disruption of having to relocate from your home, from your social circle, from the place that you find uh, is the place of greater safety. He had relocated. As if that was not enough, Abraham had gone through grief and sorrow. His father, Terah, had died in Haran. Abraham had gone through economic hardships. He had to live with his family through a famine, and they had to go and seek refuge in Egypt for survival. Abraham had had to go through family disagreements. He experienced what arguments within the family to the point of separation within the family is concerned. He had to separate with Lot. Abraham had gone through difficulty. But this one, this one was in a class of, his, of its own. Let's see how Abraham managed to go through his greatest test ever. Because there may be someone here that is going through their greatest test ever. And you're wondering, how will I be able to go through this. The passage that we're in is Genesis chapter 22. That's where we're drawing the lessons um, today from. That's where we're drawing our inspiration from today. Genesis chapter 22. As we usually do, uh, we stand up for the reading of the scriptures. Why don't we honor God's word and rise to our feet as we read from the scriptures. It will be on your screen in NIV. So you're welcome to read along uh, with us. Genesis uh, chapter 22. Shall we read together for verse 1? Some time later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Then God said, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain that I will show you. Early the next morning, Abraham got up and loaded his donkey. He took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. When he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering, he set out for the place that God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. And he himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went on together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, father. Yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said. But where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. 
When they reached the place that God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of its son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. And to this day, he said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. May God bless the reading of his word. Amen. Amen. If you're here, or you're watching us online, and you're presently facing the toughest and most challenging season of your life, Life has taken the wind out of your sails. Maybe it's grief or loss. And you recently lost someone that you love so dear. And you're coming to terms with it. Maybe it's financial in nature or physical or mental health. Maybe it's a challenge in that area. Maybe it's a career crisis, or it's of spiritual nature, whatever the nature of the challenge, I'd like us to focus on this passage, and I'd like to propose to us some things that you might want to prioritize so that you can flourish even in your desert experience. There are three things that come out very clearly in this passage that Abraham and Isaac did as we transition between Abraham and Isaac as they are going through the most challenging and testing time of their lives. The first thing I see in this passage is obedience. Obedience. The second thing is confidence. And the third one is reverence. Obedience, confidence, and reverence from the verses of scripture that we have just read. Let me begin by looking at obedience. Verse 1. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, and the Bible says, Abraham. And Abraham responded to God and he said, Here I am. That's a reply that he gave. I'd like us to notice that this is the last time of eight times that God has spoken directly to Abraham. And on each and every one of those occasions, the response that we see Abraham giving God is a response of obedience. Here he said, here I am. In fact, it's not once. Three times in this passage alone, he immediately responds to God and tells God, here I am. Here I am is the language of obedience. We see this language spoken throughout biblical history where men and women of God are responding to God in obedience. You remember Moses in Genesis chapter 3, verse, sorry, Exodus chapter 3 verse 4. You remember Moses when God called him from the burning bush. He says, here I am. You remember Samuel. Uh, Eli, when he's responding to Samuel, he responds and says, here I am. Then he realizes that it is God. When Samuel told him, it's God that is calling you, he says, here I am in 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 4. This phrase, here I am, reflects a heart of obedience. This phrase reflects somebody inclined to obey God. Abraham's quick answer and Abraham's quick response to God is how we too should respond to God. It means and we're telling God, God, I'm here and I'm ready to be taught. God, I'm here and I'm ready to surrender. God, I'm here and I'm ready to be examined by you. 
This is the language of soldiers when they respond and they know that they are responding to their commanding officer. And they are saying, I am at your service. I am here. I am present. I am ready to respond to whatever command that you're giving. So we see immediately from Abraham's response that he's already inclined to obedience. Verse 2 says, take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on the mountain that I will show you. The reason why God told him your only son is because in chapter 21, we already know that Abraham had another son uh, from his maid servant, Hagar. His other son was called Ishmael, but in chapter 21, Abraham had already sent them away and they were not physically present there. God is not just referring to the only son that you presently have in your home, but he's saying the only son that I recognize because that is the son of promise, the one I promised to be able uh, to give you. God tells Abraham, take that son to the region that is called the region of Moriah. Now, he was living in the desert of Bathsheba. The desert of Bathsheba was about 90 kilometers away from this region of Moriah. The region of Moriah was a hilly region north, in the northern part of Jerusalem. Many of us know this region because in the book of First Chronicles chapter 21, this is the place where David purchases a piece of land which later on Solomon builds the temple on this same area. Today we know it as the mosque that is in Jerusalem. It's called the Dome of the Rock. This mosque is built over this altar in this passage where Abraham offers his son to God as a sacrifice. It's one of the most significant holy sites in the world. Now God tells him, go there. And go there and sacrifice your son. You need to appreciate the weight of this command that is being given to Abraham and to Sarah. Because Abraham and Sarah had waited so long for this child. As soon as this son came about, Abraham and Sarah must have doted over their precious son. They must have taken care of him and nurtured him with the best food, with a comfortable environment. They must have watched over him and protected him from all harm, all sickness, all injury. They must have taken care of their miracle son because this was the hope of their future. But now, when this son is about 20 years of age, now, the very God that had given them this son and had promised them this son is now telling them to do the unthinkable. Is telling them to take their son of promise. This son that they had pinned all their hopes on and is telling them to now sacrifice this son as a burnt offering to God. God's command this particular command that he gives Abraham seems to threaten everything that Abraham had lived for. It seems to threaten everything that Abraham had fought for. It seems to threaten everything that Abraham had prayed for. God seems sometimes to ask us to bear the unbearable. And that's what Abraham felt. In fact, every phrase of God's command to Abraham must have cut him like a knife. Take your son, your only son, whom you love. Offer him as a burnt offering. Each and every one of these phrases felt like a dagger in his heart. And he felt the pain and the weight of every piece of this command. That God is giving him. But look at Abraham's response. In verse 3. Early the next morning. Abraham got up. Loaded his donkey. And he took with him two of his servants and his son Isaac. And when he had cut enough wood for the burnt offering. He set off to the place that God had told him about. 
You remember when Pastor Bella was taking us through uh, Abraham's uh, you know, earlier journey, she mentioned to us that in previous chapters, Abraham had argued with God, especially when we're going through the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. He argued with God and told God he has relatives that are there. God, would you be able to spare him? And he argued with God. But what surprises me here is the minute this command is given, we see no sign of hesitation. No sign of hesitation in obeying. Maybe after the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham had learned that it is futile to try and argue with God. So maybe he immediately, because he had learned the lesson then, he immediately submits and says, God, I submit to this command. But what I think is Abraham had grown in his ability to trust God fully. He had grown in his faith. And at this point in his life, he made a decision, regardless what God says, I will trust him. Abraham trusted God, even when he did not understand God. He trusted God, even when he did not feel like it. He trusted God, because he walked by faith, and not by feelings. You know, sometimes... We say, I'm not going to obey until I understand. And we go to God and tell God, until I understand why I am in my health crisis. Until I understand why I'm in my financial crisis. Until I understand why this grief and loss is happening in our family. Until I understand why you took away my loved one. Until I understand, I will not obey you. And I'd like to tell us that sometimes putting yourself at a place where you demand to understand God in order to obey God is putting yourself at the same level of understanding with God. You're sometimes putting yourself at an equal standing with God. And everything about that seems wrong. Because Isaiah 55 verse 8 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than yours. And my thoughts so far greater than yours. My level of understanding and God's level of understanding is worlds apart. And there are sometimes God desires to explain it to us, but we will not understand because we are not God. And there are some questions and some situations that we go through that raises some questions that we can't ourselves understand or answer. There are times as members of Nairobi Chapel, you come to us as a pastorate and ask us some difficult question. Why did God allow this? And many times I've answered to many of us here, I would claim to be God if I can explain to you why you're in the situation that you are. Because the reality is sometimes we will never be able to understand. But Abraham made a decision that even though he does not understand why God has allowed him to be in the situation or the circumstance that he's in, that will not determine his trust in God. He made a decision that I will trust you, God, even though I do not understand you. Because sometimes God doesn't take away the mystery by explaining it to us. He doesn't take away the pain by dismissing it. But instead, he offers his presence in the midst of it. Sometimes he doesn't take away the mystery by explaining it to us. But instead, he assures us his presence in the midst of it. And Abraham could obey God because he made a decision to be able to trust him. So the first thing is obedience. The second thing is confidence that I see in this passage. Confidence. From verse 4 to verse 6. On the third day, verse 4, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. He said to his servants, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham had three long days to think 
over what God had commanded him to do. These three days must have made this circumstance or situation even worse. Because he had time to be able to wrestle even more with this command. And it looks as if the pain was being prolonged. It looked as if the confusion was being prolonged. It looked as if the challenge or the difficulty was being prolonged. But you see, these days gave him an opportunity to turn back. He had a chance. If he wanted to turn back, he could have turned back on the first day, or the second day, or the third day. But Abraham, we see, even on the third day, Abraham still had full confidence in God by how he spoke to his servants. He spoke to his servants and he told them, stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship. And then he says what? We will we will come back to you. Abraham knew he's been told to go and sacrifice his son. He knew sacrificing his son meant death. Why did he tell his servants, we will come back to you? There's a statement of confidence that I know that <laughs> I know that it is impossible for God to break his promise. He makes a statement to his servants that I will come back with this son of promise. I am sure that God cannot break his promise. Abraham probably thought that for God's promise to be fulfilled, Isaac has to be alive. For God's covenant to remain his covenant, then even though he allows me to kill Isaac, then God should be able to raise him from the dead. I'm sure that even though God allows me to kill Isaac, that God will bring him back to life because he needs to be alive for that promise to be fulfilled, for God to keep his covenant. I'm sure he thought the one who created the universe, the one who created human life, pro of course, the very one that created the entire universe and human life, he should be able to have the power to bring back life. That's probably what he thought. He probably thought Isaac was a miracle. His birth was a miracle. And even though he died, then God would do another miracle to bring him back to life. He probably thought that. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17, we see a glimpse of what he probably was processing. The Bible says, By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, concluding that God was able to raise him up from the dead. I'd like us to recognize that at this point in biblical history, we have no record of anyone being raised from the dead. Abraham did not have an example to look back to to see that God raises people from the dead. Abraham did not have an example of a resurrected body that he can refer to to know that God truly has the power to resurrect the dead. Abraham had no precedent to look back to. Abraham decided all that he has was, a, was the promise from God that God was able to raise him up from the dead and God was able to do it. He did not place his confidence on precedent. He did not place his confidence on something that had happened before. He placed his confidence on the nature and the character of God. He is a promise-keeping God. He is a covenant-keeping God. And God will continue consistently in his character. His confidence was in God. The third thing is reverence that I see in this passage. Not just immense and deep confidence in God, but reverence for God. In verse 7 on to verse 14, we see this reverence play out as he finally goes ahead with the sacrifice. Isaac spoke up to his father and said, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and the wood is here, but where is the lamb? And we see Abraham again saying, God himself will provide a lamb for the offering. Now, we said Isaac was probably 20 years old at, at this time. Isaac was old enough to sense that something was amiss. Isaac 
interrupts his father's thoughts and as they're walking towards this place of sacrifice and tells him the wood is here, the fire is here, but there's something that is missing, the sacrificial lamb. And look at the statement that Abraham makes. He said, God will provide. Abraham knew that God would provide a sacrifice. But at this point, Abraham did not know how God would provide. He just knew God would provide. Again, not questioning God's character. Not questioning God's nature. Because there's a difference between trusting the promise and trusting the promiser. Trusting the person that has given you the promise. That's the place that Abraham had reached with God. Where he trusted the promiser. He had gone beyond trusting the promise. To the place where he trusted the promiser himself. Verse 9. When they reached the place that God had told them about. Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar. And on top. Sorry. Laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Now very, very, very quickly. It becomes clear to Isaac that he is the sacrifice. He realizes here there is no lamp. There is no mbuzi. I am the mbuzi. I am the one who is being placed on this altar. But I'd like us to notice. This is a 20 something year old strong young man. <laughs> he willingly allowed himself to be placed on the altar. Because a 20 something year old yeah, would have taken off. And a 100 and something year old old man would have had no compare with him. To be able to catch him and bring him up to the altar. Isaac would have immediately outrun his father and disappeared completely and been able to escape this imminent death. But Isaac did not because Isaac chose to respect and submit, to respect and submit his earthly father. The same way his earthly father had chosen to respect and submit to his heavenly father. We see reverence throughout this particular situation right here where both of them are submitted to their fathers. Abraham is submitted to his heavenly father to do the unthinkable. Isaac is submitted to his father. He's willingly bound. He lays down on the wood. He's ready to be sacrificed. He trusts and honors his father's request for him to lay on the altar and to allow himself to be bound. Verse 10, then he reached out his hand, now Abraham, and he took the knife to slay his son. With trembling, with trembling, Abraham now begins this ceremony of sacrifice. Abraham turns to his son, he looks at his son, the delight of his life. And as he lifted up this blade, Isaac's heart must have been beating in fear. Both of them, Abraham and Isaac, must have been confused. What in the world is going on? My father sacrificing me? And the father must be looking down. I sacrificing my son? They must have been confused. And Abraham probably with a knife, with tears flowing down his cheeks, must have been thinking, where can I drive this dagger through to make it as quick and as painless as possible for my son? He probably was strategizing to try and make this sacrifice as easy for this young man that he has treasured and loved so dearly. And as he prepared to strike, Suddenly he hears a voice in verse 11. An angel of the Lord called out from, from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. And he, he said, do not lay a hand on your boy. Do not do anything to him. Do you see the statement immediately after that? He says, now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld 
from me, verse 12, your son and your only son. God says to Abraham, I never wanted Isaac's life. All I wanted was your obedience. All I wanted was your confidence. And all I wanted was your reverence. All I wanted, all I wanted was for this test to reveal that you still have a high view of God. You still fear God more than anyone else. You still consider God more worthy than anything that you have. You still honor and confirm that God is number one in your life. God confirms that Isaac had not come between Abraham and God. That Abraham was willing, regardless what it is, to give it up so that he can confirm his ultimate allegiance to God. Isaac was not more important to Abraham than God. If anything had become an idol to Abraham, it probably would have been Isaac. But God confirms through this test that Abraham still has God as his number one. By binding Isaac on the wood, by tying up Isaac on this altar and binding up Isaac on the wood, what Abraham was ultimately doing was Abraham was making a statement that he is bound to God. That he God and him are inseparable. That nothing will ever come in between them. The wood that Isaac was placed on represents a statement that God was number one priority to Abraham. He was making a statement that Isaac has not come between us. And nothing, however precious it is, can come in between I and God. God wants to be number one in our lives. God wants to be top priority in our lives. And anything above him immediately becomes an idol. You know, sometimes we think about idols and we think these are statues made of gold or silver or wood or stone. Most of our idols are actually the good things that God has blessed us with. But we have allowed these good things to come in between us and God. Our children, our family, our marriage, our fame, our reputation, our career, our money, our home, our position, our education, our property, our networks our friends, our degrees, accomplishments, the classes that we have taught, the buildings that we have built, the organizations that we have managed, the books that we have written, the songs that we have sung, the trips that we have taken, the portfolios that we have built, the things that make us feel significant, the things that make us safe, or the things that give us status in this world have come in between us and God. An idol can be something good, but it's anything that becomes more important to me than God. Anything that takes the place of God in my life. And I'd like to tell us, and this is probably the catchphrase in this section of reverence, hold lightly what you value greatly. And hold tightly what you value ultimately. Abraham was willing to give back to God what was God's in the first place. This son was a gift from God. Ultimately, this son belonged to God. Sometimes, we allow the things that God has blessed us with to come in between us and God. And sometimes God needs to shake 
up our life. And God needs to destabilize our life. And God needs to shake us up so that what belongs to the bottom goes to the bottom. And what belongs to the top goes to the top. So that he can reprioritize our lives. And we realize that some things we hold too dear at the end of the day are not as important as he is. Sometimes when the things that God has blessed us with begin to cloud us or define us, God sometimes needs to bring us back to Moriah, this hill country, this mountain that we see Abraham going to because this is the place of sacrifice. This is the place where your priorities are reorganized. And many times, the shaking that is happening in our lives is simply God trying to get his rightful place again. God trying to reorganize and reprioritize our lives. There's a lady called Karen Watson that was executed in Iraq because of her faith. And she wrote a letter and said, only open this letter after my death. And this is what she said. Care more than some think is wise. Risk more than some think is safe. Dream more than some think is practical. Expect more than some think is possible. I was called not to comfort or to success, but to obedience. And that is his call to all of us. When her very life was at stake, she had made the same covenant that Abraham had made. That there is nothing more important than obeying God. Verse 13 and verse 14, the last uh, two verses uh, today. Abraham looked up and there in the thicket, he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and he took the ram and he sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place, the Lord will provide. Abraham named the place Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. I'd like us to notice that Abraham says nothing about himself in how he names this place. He didn't name the place in reference to what he went through. He didn't name the place in reference to the trials or the hardships or the challenges that he went through. He did not name it Mount Trial. He did not name it Mount Agony. He did not name it Mount Pain. He did not name it even Mount Obedience. And that's what he was being told. He did not name it any of those names. He named it Mount the Lord will provide, Mount Provider, because it was in reference to what God had done when he was in his desert experience. He called it Mount Provision, in reference to what God had done and not in reference to what he had gone through. I'd like to ask you, will you rename your desert experience today? Will you rename it in reference to God's agenda? Would you rename it in reference to what God has done? Would you rename it in reference to how you have seen God in that desert experience? And not what you have gone through. And not even what you have lost. Not even what you have had to give up. It's all in reference to what God has done. What is your desert experience? Be it your marriage or your job or your health or your business or your children or your education or your investments. Whatever desert experience, challenging experience you're going to, can you rename it today and give it a name that reflects God and give it a name that reflects what God wants to do and has done in your life through that experience? As we conclude, Isaac's life is actually a picture of Jesus Christ. And this sacrifice that we see in Genesis chapter 22 is actually a picture of the sacrifice 
that Jesus Christ made for us. Look at the clear parallels. Both Jesus Christ and Isaac were loved dearly by their father. Both Jesus Christ and Isaac offered themselves willingly to be sacrificed. Both Jesus Christ and Isaac carried wood on their backs, on their way to their place of sacrifice. For Jesus Christ, he carried the cross of Calvary on their way to be sacrificed. Both Jesus Christ and Isaac were sacrificed on the same hill, Mount Moriah, the same area of Jerusalem. That was the same area. And it's very interesting that both Jesus Christ and Isaac were delivered on the third day. The same way Jesus Christ was delivered from death on the third day when he rose up from the grave. We see here a clear substitute offering being given to Abraham. God's love for us is great. And it is seen in how God offered his one and only son to die on the cross for you and for I. Abraham displayed his heart towards God in his willingness to give up his only son to God. But God demonstrates and displays his heart and his love towards us in his willingness to give his one and only begotten son. When God asked Abraham for the ultimate demonstration of love, he asked for Abraham's son. But when God the Father wanted to show us his ultimate demonstration of love, he gave us his one and only son. The heart of a worshiper, a true worshiper, is not how loud we sing. The heart of a true worshiper is in our willingness to give up the most precious things to us to reflect our greater love for God than for the things that God has blessed us with. God desires our hearts. God desires our devoted hearts more than anything else we can give to him. God desires a heart of obedience, a heart that has confidence in him, and a heart that fears him as Abraham did. Will you trust God like Abraham in your desert experience? Will you choose to obey God? And would you make a covenant of obedience with God, even as you continue in your desert experience? This morning, are you arguing with God and demanding to understand God before you obey Him as you go through the difficulty and the challenge that you're presently going through? Or like Abraham, would you say, God, I trust you as the promiser. I may not understand what I'm going through right now, but I trust you. I trust you that you can be able to carry me through. Are you here and you're going through an impossible situation, but you are placing your confidence on others? And God is saying, choose to put your confidence in me, like Abraham did. Or you're here and maybe your struggle is idols. Idols that have taken the place of God in your life. Remember I said sometimes God has to take us to Mount Moriah to reprioritize our lives. Shall we bow our heads as we respond to God in prayer? If this is you, this is the circumstance or the situation that you're in and God has spoken to you and you're saying, God, I want to make a covenant of obedience to you. I want to stop arguing and demanding to understand what's happening around me. I choose to trust you. I choose to trust you. I may not feel it. I may not understand it. 
but I know that I trust you this morning, this afternoon. I'd like you to put up your hand. If you're here and you're saying, I'm going through an impossible situation and, and I put confidence in others, but I want to shift my confidence from all the other things I've placed confidence in and I want to shift it to you. Just put up your hand wherever you are. If you're here and you're saying, I want to bring down all these idols, the things that I have placed my trust in or the things that I'm depending on in my life, and they may be good things, but they've come in between me and God. And I don't want anything to come in between me and God. Just make a covenant with God. As your hand is lifted up, make a prayer. Make a prayer, make a covenant to God and say, I want to be like Abraham. To walk a journey of obedience. To walk a journey of full confidence in God. To walk a journey of true reverence before God. Where I fear God more than anything else. Father, thank you for your word to us. And I know we may be in our desert experiences. We may be in a testing season. We may, we may be on our moriah. I pray that, Lord Jesus, would you allow us, O oh God, to experience the amazing power of God when we respond to God correctly in our desert experience. Father, I pray that would you reprioritize our lives and find yourself enthroned even though we're going through a difficult and challenging season. Father, for those that have been arguing with you and, and demanding to understand, Father, we lay down that right and say, Lord Jesus, we are not going to demand to understand every detail about the difficult and challenging season that we're in. Instead, we are going to choose to trust you. So, Father, I pray that would you assure us of your presence Assure us, O oh God, of your promises. Assure us, O oh God, that you're going to walk with us this entire journey. Would you protect us all the way? Father, for those that have allowed something to come in between them and God, however pleasant and amazing these gifts are that you have blessed us with, Father, I pray that you allow us, O oh God, to place you in your rightful place in our lives. Father, I pray that would you allow us to reprioritize God and let God be God. And whatever it is you're asking us to give up, we give it up. And we pray that, Lord Jesus, would you have your rightful place. Father, if we placed our confidence in anything other than you, would you restore that place of confidence in God and enable God to truly have his rightful place in our lives. So thank you, Lord, for your word to us. And I pray that you allow us to continue to flourish even though we are going through a difficult season and come out at the end and truly reap the benefit of trusting God and fulfilling and seeing God fulfill His promises in our lives. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and may the love of God and may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you. God bless you.